coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing podcast. After everyone is gone, everyone drives away. Most years, I'm, there's a creek that runs through there, and I'll just go sit in the creek and drink a beer and just sit there uh, for, for a while and let it all kind of melt away. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's worth it for me. Um, I've, I've gained a lot of great friends through this who, who then will come run with me in the woods, just, you know, just a couple of us. And that's, that's awesome. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a lot about the, how this thing has gone. And... That was Andrew Todd reflecting on the fly athlon, trail running beer and fly fishing today on the wet fly swing fly fishing show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the show. Please leave a review for this show if you get a chance. A five-star review would be super appreciated for this podcast. And if you've been enjoying this thing, you can leave one right now on whatever app you're on. If you leave a review right now, and take a screenshot, send it to me. I will send you a wet fly swing hat. We've got some new hats coming in uh, as we speak. Fairflies creates ethically sourced premium fly tying materials with their 5D brushes. You simply tie better flies faster. 5D brushes contain perfectly proportioned materials to tie amazing streamers, bass flies, saltwater flies, and more. Fairflies is also creating intentional supply chains so you can change the world with every fly you tie. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash fairflies right now. That's fairflies, F-A-I-R-F-L-I-E-S. Check them out right now. We are also sponsored by Lake Lady Rods, building distinctive custom rods, each created one at a time to the exact specifications for each angler. I just got back from a stillwater trip to Kamloops and had the four weight out with a sinking line using that uh, clear camo. The thing was casting like a dream. This thing uh, is really nice. I can't even explain how Chris does it, but it's very unique and uh, and very nice to cast. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash lake lady right now, L-A-K-E-L-A-D-Y to support this podcast in a great rod builder. Andrew Todd takes us to the flyathlon and we find out how to mix beer, trail running, and fly fishing into one big outdoor party. We find out how they are on track to raise almost $500,000 for conservation projects through uh, this event. We also hear about some of the challenges over the years um, and and where they are heading kind of with that vision down the line. We also managed to get Andrew's top fly today, which was uh, which was a little bit of a challenge because he had uh, he had three flies, I guess three or four flies. But we got that one about him. So you can go to our top fly challenge right now as well. Without further ado, here he is, Andrew Todd from RunningRivers.org. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna dig into today on the uh, not the flyathon. Don't be confused. This is not a, a flyathon. This is the flyathlon, which is actually makes totally makes a lot of sense because um, that's a serious challenge. When I think of the you know uh, whatever, right? A, a triathlon. Um, swimming, what is it? Swimming, running, and uh, what, what's the, what's the other leg? Biking and biking. biking is yeah, and biking. So whenever I think of that, I've always thought like, wow, okay, I do okay in biking, running. That seems that's doable, but the swimming is the one that would just kill me. And uh, and so we're gonna dig into like maybe for you, what, what's the most challenging thing of this um, of what you do here? Um, sure. And then, uh, but start us off with the fly fishing. I like to go back. People that are listening love to hear, you know, how everybody first got into fly fishing. So how'd that happen for you? Well, uh, as a kid, I I grew up here in Denver, and my father is a uh, pediatrician. And every every summer, he would take us up to an infectious disease conference in Aspen, and we'd dork around around Aspen. And and one year, he he decided he was going to take us fishing and and took us up um, a creek called Lincoln Creek, and it was amazing fishing and we all thought we were incredible fisher people until we discovered that he had called uh, Colorado Division of Wildlife at the time and had found out that there was a stocking truck headed up Lincoln Creek that day and the, the guy at the Division of Wildlife told him, uh, here's exactly where you want to go and directed him to this boulder 
where apparently the stocking truck lever had jammed and dumped the entire load of rainbow trout into Lincoln Creek. And so we, <laughs> he took us directly there and we were successful and, you know, it, it, it didn't really stick for me in a, in a big way until college when a roommate of mine really got me into fly fishing. And then, uh, I stayed at his place. He worked for trout unlimited after college and I stayed at his place in the Catskills I was his intern actually for a summer, which was a total scam, <laughs> but, uh, that he had a pond on the property he was staying on. And that's when I really, really got into it. And so I'd say my twenties is when he really, really got into fly fishing big time. There you go. So twenties. And I love, I hear that a lot where people, it's like the planting of the seed, you know, some, a lot of times they'll have a parent or a grandparent or something that kind of early on get some rolling, but they don't really take. And then later on, but the seed was planted. And then later on, like you said, in your twenties, you get into it and then, and then you're like, I'm sure hooked, right? Totally hooked into it. Yeah. As, as a teen, you're totally into other stuff. Like our family played lacrosse. And so there were lacrosse camps every summer and, you know, you're preoccupied with, with that sort of stuff. I, I don't think for most people fly fishing shows up on a, a resume to submit to colleges. So yeah. Uh, which it should. I think it should. I think there's a couple that where it would, right? Back in the right. the east, I think there's maybe some stuff there. But yeah. Um and, and your dad, that's interesting, you know, with the infectious disease conference. How does that how does when you think of that, I don't know how well you remember that, but how does that um that event compare to the uh the events that you do now? Is there any any similarities? Uh, you know, we we were never invited to actually attend the infectious disease conference, but I will say you know, my dad is still one of my favorite people to go, to go fishing with. And, um, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's closing in on 80. So waiting isn't what it used to be. And so we have a role that I'm, I'm downstream of, uh, him just in case he starts to drift, but we, we still love to get out. And I really look back fondly on, you know, him, him getting us outside and I'm, I'm a real outdoors person now both professionally and in my personal life so I, I credit that to my to my dad in large uh, large part yeah do you with your dad do you remember I you know I always think of myself I remember that time kind of where I transitioned where my dad was always the the rock star you know fished all the time and was the leader always and then it switched right as he got at some age and then I became the person who was doing it do you remember that with you guys you know, I, I would argue that I've always been better than oh, okay. than he is, yeah. and he would he would say that I just uh, cheat and I poach holes from him, and so I, I'm not sure there's there's a fair uh, assessment of who's better, but um, I would I would assert it's me. You got gotcha gotcha yeah, cool. <laughs> Nice. Well, well, it's all led into, I mean, it seems to me like it's led into a, a project, um, you know, which I heard about. And we actually talked quite a while. I remember when I first heard it, maybe a couple years ago, I was like, oh, wow, that was interesting. I think it was right when I was trying to run my own. I was getting into trail running and I was running. And, and of course, I've always loved fly fishing. So I was like, wow, this this actually sounds cool. You bring both the, and, and you add you add the beer, right? You, you have the two and then you got the three. So so talk about this uh, this. Um, Flyathlon for somebody who hasn't heard about it. What, what's this all about? Describe to it as a new person. Yeah, so it, it it's kind of a uh, we were poking fun at uh, the swim bike run uh, USA triathlon a little bit when we created the motto, which is run fish beer. So it it smashes up uh, trail running, fly fishing, and and craft beer, which which my lawyer uh, told me could not be an official part of the race. It's not required. In essence, you have to complete the course, which depending on, on the race, it's not an exact distance. So you're not going to see any 26.2 stickers or anything mm -hmm. like that. It's, it's based on whatever the fishing dictates pretty much. So if there were a lake that was five miles out, it would be a 10 mile out and back race. But so you start the race, we start it by shooting a, a crappy domestic beer and that's been kind of all over the map that's a sacrifice to the craft beer gods and um, so that starts the race and then people run along the course which in in both of our colorado races one is a small creek called middle creek and the other race is uh the lake fork of the gunnison which is a bigger river 
So you're running along and at some point there aren't fixed stations like there are in other fly fishing competitions. But at some point you break off and you go and try to catch a fish. And the rules are at the finish line, you can report one fish so you can catch as many as you want. But you get one fish that we're going to measure the distance of and that adjusts your your uh, your score. So it, it takes some strategy and that. If you're fast, you get to see all the water first, but as soon as you break off and start fishing, everyone's going past you and you, you, you're you kind of locked into whatever hole you, you picked. So it takes some strategy. And I've known people who have come out the week before because one of the creeks, the, the smaller creek, really, it's got beaver in it. And so it's changing a lot between years. So people will come out and scout the course and figure out where they're going to go. And so, um, so yeah, you got to run. Both courses in Colorado are out and back. So my my neighbor uh, sits at the top of the course in one of them and at the bottom in the other with uh, whiskey and salmon and cheese. And so that's the turnaround point. And so you have to check in with him and then make it back to the start and at some point along the way catch a fish. And when you get back to the finish line, we're looking at a picture of the fish and determining length of it. We used to put them on. Um, uh, our fish race bibs, which were, you know, a sheet of right in the rain paper with a ruler on it, but with the keep them wet and, and all that, we've, we've really tried to, this is a conservation event ultimately. Yeah. So we've tried to, uh, indoctrinate folks with the right ways to handle fish, keep them, keep them hooked until that last minute before taking a picture. And so we've moved away from the, the race bibs a little bit, which makes it harder to, to evaluate how long a fish is, but it's pretty easy to tell a really small fish from a big fish. And so we're, yeah. we're doing our best. And then the scores are calculated and we have a top male, top female, biggest fish, smallest fish. Uh, and then those folks compete at the after party, which is, I, I would argue is the best part of the event, which we're, we're holding these in some pretty remote places. So folks come from all over the country really, but, but in large part from, from Denver. So we, we have a lot of camper vans and, folks showing up to in in the lake fort case it's this big blm field where everyone sets up shop and we have a big um, we have a kegerator or a jockey box that pours two craft beers and nice uh, we get it catered by a local restaurant and 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 at that point those those winners are competing against each other in a cornhole followed by a, a bb rifle shootout oh, for, right. for the grand prize that's sweet. That is, man, you've got it. Sounds like you've, uh, you've tweaked this thing to, to become quite an event, you know, because all these things you talk about, I mean, definitely cornhole and, and BB rifle are two of my favorites. And then, you know, I mean, there's so much going on here. I, I, I kind of go back to the, the event, you know, so it's, it's running and then it's also fishing. So do you find that, I'm not sure if you've got any, I know Colorado does have lots of Olympic, uh, you know, definitely lots of Olympic athletes and stuff. So do you do you find the winners of the event are typically more people that are uh, um, that type, uh, trail runners, Olympic athletes, or more of the fly fishermen that kind of can run a little bit? Well, so, so it's kind of a mixed uh, bag of who signs up. We've got, uh, I, I'd say for most folks who are signing up, it's the running part that is the the red flag for them um but we try to make it accessible to as many people as possible by we set our our uh cut off times um very generously so like the middle creek race is seven miles and it, it's around seven hours uh that, that we're asking people to complete that distance and catch a fish which is not not difficult to do um and in terms of winning yeah the, the faster folks uh who can also fish or are the ones who are winning top male and female, but uh, we also have the biggest and smallest fish. So someone who's plodding along and taking their time can hook into the the biggest fish if they're a good angler. Uh, so, so then they're in the mix for the the grand champion at the end of it all. So we're trying to be as inclusive as possible because all these things, right? Uh, craft beer, trail running, and fly fishing can all be for lack of a better word, douchey, like, you right. know, and, and intimidating to folks. Yeah. Uh, so yep. we're trying to destigmatize them and, and have them be accessible and teach people you don't need to buy $2,000 worth of equipment to be a yep. good a good fly fisherman. You can just throw something in the back of the truck and go to your local creek. And, yeah. and you don't have to go to a guide shop, although 
guide shops definitely have their place and and it's a different kind of fishing but we're we're trying to make it as accessible so more people will get into the sport and then care about the resource that's it yeah so it's less about yeah the competition and i'm sure you probably maybe some people don't like yeah the competition stuff as much but it's really not it sounds like it's not a competition it's more just a way to have some prizes and keep it uh kind of engaging and fun right yeah that said we do have some some folks who are are really uh world-class trail runners that show up and um they can be pretty intense but but whiskey is the ultimate equalizer at the top and all oh, so, right so they have to drink it <laughs> they don't have to but but yeah. you know if you've got someone who's rolling in 30 minutes before everyone else there's my, my neighbor may or may not pressure folks to <laughs> to to consider a, a shot of our our uh, local whiskey Right, right, cool. So this is uh, this is a good event, and then you guys uh, talk about. Uh, so when is this? You have a few events. When when are they? Yeah, the the first one's in uh, July. I think it's the weekend of July twenty third, and the second one is in September. Um, that's the Bigger River Lake Fork race, uh, and then the the we we have a third race that is in Iowa, um, in the Driftless region of Iowa, so the far northeast corner, that is organized by. Two of our board members, uh, Running Rivers has a board of 15, and two of them uh, organize this this race, which is related, but its own distinct entity. And they they do an incredible job of uh, getting folks from the Midwest out to to recreate in this Yellow River State Forest, which is a cool place. It's a, a spring-fed uh, creek system that um, pretty amazing. I, I went out one year, and it, it, it blew my mind that below the cornfields there's this uh trout fishery yeah how do you when you uh, iowa uh, that event started were you taking a big lead and making sure that you know turned out like you liked it or did you kind of leave it to them to make it up so i had someone who had participated in one of ours he reached out and said i'd like to do this in iowa and i was incredulous that there were trout in iowa and i gave him the basics of what's involved and we want to some consistency within the the brand so it doesn't go all over the place but beyond that i really just turned it over to to them and they organize it and they're crushing it on fundraising too so and and i view that since i have a day job as if this thing is going to grow and we we always get people inquiring like when are you going to put one on in the northeast or um if this thing is going to grow it's going to be with people like that who recognize the possibility for their backyard and, and then take the initiative and, and work with us to make sure that they're not running into the same pitfalls that we did over the years. And um, so really my hope is that as this grows, people will just take ownership of it and, and turn it into their own uh, good thing for their backyard. What were some of the, for you, the, those pitfalls, like as you, and this has been a little while, right? You, you started this, uh, talk about when you started and then what were some of those pitfalls were to get it to the level it's at now? Yeah, we, we did, um, an unofficial one, I think in 2013 and then we've held them since, except for in 2020 where we went virtual, like every other race and, and business <laughs> in the country. Um, we called that the, uh, socially distanced flyathlon challenge which is a mouthful but um so yeah the pitfalls i mean it it's just ironing out where to hold these things um how to do the camping part right Mm. how to get the right caterer how to build the community uh because we we've had real good luck that most of the people that show up are are great people and come back year to year but we, we've had a couple of bad apples in the mix insurance yeah. um the first three years we were operating under a, a fiscal uh sponsorship of sort through trout unlimited and and that had its pluses and minuses and that's ultimately why we created our own nonprofit to house it as opposed to housing it out of trout unlimited so stuff like that and and, and there's just easy lessons learned that you wouldn't necessarily think about unless you've been holding them for for eight years like minimize the number of road crossings so that you have you don't need as many volunteers out there and communications like if you're holding it in the canyon you got to have enough radios out there so the top knows what's happening at the bottom that sort of stuff bear vault keeps adventure going strong this year and ensures your backcountry trip will stay epic and safe 
Bear Vault builds a rugged polycarbonate locking canister that keeps bears and other wild animals away from your stuff. This keeps your food safe, keeps you safe, and actually keeps the bears safe. I've noted my classic story a while back uh, from a trip up to Alaska and had, I've had some run-ins with bears along the way and definitely there were a few times where I wish I would have had the bear vault to, uh, to keep my stuff secure and not have to worry about it. That problem is not an issue. So if you're in any areas or going into any areas where you're going to be dealing with bears, wild critters, it might even be, it might even be mice. Uh, you know what I mean? If you want to keep your stuff safe, that's, that's at the basic level. Um, it's pretty cool. There's a couple of features that make the Bear Vault uh, pretty awesome, and one of them is the wide uh, opening at the top, so you can easily access all your stuff. It's also clear, so if you're on a trip, you can easily kind of see where your stuff's at and go down and grab your food. And uh, But overall, it just allows you to sleep soundly, knowing everything's secure. I definitely love the bonus feature for me is the, uh, the camp stool. So you've always got a little camp stool, a little bonus feature uh, when you're out there um, hiking, boating, whatever you're going to be using, uh, wherever, whatever and wherever you're going to be using the Bear Vault. You can check in uh, with the crew at Bear Vault right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash Bear Vault. That's B-E-A-R-V-A-U-L-T. Check them out right now. You support this podcast by clicking through that link to Bear Vault. What is on the conservation piece? Talk about that a little bit. It sounds like that's a pretty big part of this uh, this event. What, what do you guys do there? Yeah, because all of us, my entire board is is volunteers. So we like partying in the woods, but we're not doing this for for our health. We we use this to raise money for native trout restoration projects. So the the model is sort of we get sixty five to seventy people to sign up for each event, and then we incentivize those people leading up to the event to crowdfund for conservation uh, through our organization. And we incentivize that with products that are donated from a, a wide range of, of sponsors from, from folks like Patagonia to Yeti to uh, we've got a number of uh, fly fishing companies that donate products. And so we'll, we'll incentivize people say like, Hey, if you raise 50 bucks over the next two weeks, you'll be entered for, for a drawing for x y or z and then that that's how we incentivize up to the race but then at the race we're we're rewarding the top three fundraisers at each event with a package of great stuff that's that's been put together uh for from our sponsors and so that's uh that's how we get the money in the door and in terms of how we spend it because we're all volunteer we do some volunteer projects uh our, our board members we've got one on trout unlimited one with uh, colorado parks and wildlife so the projects that are coming to us some of the work we're doing but a lot of it we're giving money to organizations like trout unlimited um and national park service and bureau of land management and the money's super valuable to them because it doesn't have the strings attached that some other funding potential funding sources have in terms of a match. It can be yeah. that match for another grant. And so people are, are really starting to uh, look to us to, to help um, to help to get projects to the, to the finish line. And we've, we've got some pretty great projects that we've helped to, to get to that finish line. And, and one of them is this, uh, uh, Sand Creek, which is the northern half of Great Sand Dunes uh, uh, National Park and Preserve, and that's a that's a creek that it's a this big connected uh, river system that has two lakes at the top, and it's perfectly situated to to buffer against the the effects of climate change that we anticipate warmer water, drier conditions at times, and so the fish that were in there which were brook trout which are non-native to colorado and the uh, a non-native cutthroat are, are being removed and then we're putting in the, the rio grande cutthroat mm. trout so hopefully this will be a stronghold for this this native fish for for decades to come so that's the kind of project where we've got a real native trout focus and and because we raise this money ourselves we can drive the bus and and really say yeah we've got thirty thousand dollars for a project but it's got to be native trout focused not you know just a uh, like a spawning of kokanee here in colorado which is a totally oh, non -native, right. non-native fishery so yeah i gotcha no it's cool yeah so it sounds like it's 
getting some good uh, cash to go to a good uh, conservation, uh, yeah, some projects and yeah, and, and and I've been blown away by uh, the fundraising that that we've done. So in the eight years, uh, I, I'm anticipating this year we'll cross over the total of uh, half a million raised. Wow. So. Yeah, last year I think between the three events we were near ninety thousand, and my goal this year is to hit a hundred thousand. Wow! And so it's it's pretty impressive, and I, I credit our fly athletes with really getting after it and really seeing the the value added of of, of what we're trying to do here. Right, that is cool. Yeah, and, and the numbers because you mentioned sixty five to seventy people per event, right? Which isn't like a gigantic number, and you're saying those people are able to leverage uh, through their networks to this larger chunk of money. Yeah. And, and, and really it's, um, it, it comes from um, the fact that when you've got 120 people all raising a little bit of money that adds up in a hurry. And then you get four or five superstars every, every year who raise 2000, 3000. We've got a dude who's uh, committed that he's going to hit 10 grand this year, which is incredible. Yeah. And awesome. so that's, and, and we also incentivize that a little bit. We have thresholds at which like, if you hit 500 bucks, you get X and, uh, this year for, if you hit a thousand bucks, a local distillery has, is going to make some, uh, whiskey bottles with our logo on the side. And so, um, little incentives like that to, to get people to dig a little deeper and reach out to maybe, maybe grandma and grandpa instead of just their immediate family. Right. That's cool. So, so basically you have these events going a couple few throughout the year, but the rest of the time you're out there, it sounds like probably planning and fundraising and getting things rolling. Is that, are you kind of, is this a year around thing you're working on this? Yeah. Yeah. So we've got to, we've got to keep sponsors interested and, but it's also fun for all of us. So we've got a number of ways that, cause I've never actually participated in a, in a fly athlon because, because I'm always organizing them. So I've created some other, uh, ways to do this, um, in my own free time. So we've got something we call the uh, fastest known fish, which is you go out and you run to a lake and catch a fish and run back. And the and person that has the fastest time doing that is recognized on our website. And then, so someone else will be like, Oh, I could do that faster. Yeah go there we do something called fish slapping which I, I sign up for someone else's running race that happens to be near a, a fishable body of water and stop mid-race and catch a fish on so i'm running with my fly fishing stuff in a regular running race yeah and and then catch a fish and take a picture on their race bib and post it on our website <laughs> what's your uh so now, as i ask you about the gear i know i talked to uh uh, at Derek at Rare Gear, who has who's got like the telescoping fly rod, and yeah, uh, and we were talking, and this is what he's what stirred me on back to you because we had talked, we had talked a couple years ago with you, remember? Yep. And then, but just recently, uh, uh, Derek had reminded me, and uh, because he's got this telescoping fly rod, so do you find, um, well, let's just talk about the gear real quick. So, so what is that? Obviously, it's fly gear. I mean, are people coming here with like a, a, a nice size backpack with all their stuff, or is this like super streamlined with one fly and going for that? You know, it's 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 kind of a a yard sale out there. Everyone's got their own strategy, and um, I've kind of dialed it down over the years. And and Derek actually is a a sponsor of the the race this oh, year, cool. and so he sent us rods for each of the races, and and then one for me to play with. And I gotta say, I've really <laughs> really enjoyed it. It's so I have a a trail running pack that that fits right in the side and comes right out real quickly. I I'm already rigged up and it takes 20 seconds to get a fly yeah. on the water and, and packs down real fast. So it's kind of a ideal tool for, for this, uh, yep. speed fishing, which most, most people aren't speed fishing, but it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's definitely a great, great tool for that. And I'm, I'm going to get it out a lot this summer and put it through its paces on some giant cutthroat and give him feedback. But, exactly. um, I think people are really going to like that, but I also have a, I have a six piece, uh, seven foot three weight that packs down and goes into just about anything. Um, so it, it really not a lot of a, not a lot of equipment needed to, to do this. And, um, but yeah, you see some people who have a fully like a two piece fly rod stuffed oh, into wow. their backpack and running and 
and invariably every year we have someone who's lost a tip somewhere along the course and <laughs> So we're just radioing up uh, to the top to have people look forward on their way down. So. Right, right, right. Oh, that's amazing. So yeah, you got all sorts of stuff. I can imagine, you know, just myself. Uh, I mean, because I like I had the trail running stuff, right? So I still have, and I haven't been. I've been slacking on the trail running uh, as of late. But yeah, I've got the nice trail running backpack, right? So you got that that could work well. And then you just throw in a little fly box. And yeah, if you had like the rare gear, the, the rod, that's easy to have it all in one shot. And then that's pretty much all you need, right? You don't need, um, you don't really need anything else. It's not like you're, I mean, people aren't out there, they aren't stopping and fishing for an hour, right? Uh, well, they, they can. And, and so with these things like the um, fastest known fish, we've got little workarounds so that when people bust their ass to get all the way up to this high mountain lake, they're not feeling compelled to just get out of there right away oh, so right yeah but it's uh yeah it's it, it's uh minimal gear i think running shoes make perfect wading shoes as long as you don't mind the temperature and um so it, you really don't need a whole lot to to get way back there and, and get into fish so that's it that's it and then you have it's cool how you set this up. I mean, definitely the the crowdfunding piece. That's an interesting uh, process you have there. It sounds like you've really got that dialed in, and then then all the other events. Do you guys find yourself at each year just you got these things that everybody loves, or are you always tweaking and adding new kind of um, new events or new giveaways, things like that? Uh, the sponsor mix has has changed over the years, and so we're trying to keep it like you know, if your top prize is a Yeti cooler every year your top fundraisers are going to change because the, the, the person isn't going to want the big fundraiser isn't going to want to have seven Yeti coolers at home. So we're trying to mix it up a little gotcha. bit to keep people interested. And and then in terms of the race itself, um, it, we, we keep it pretty consistent. Uh, and, and people seem to like the, the model because it is so free form to begin with. Um, and, and because the course changes from year to year, year to year, the fishing is, not going to be the same in 2022 that it was in 2021. And so you gotta, it's different just by nature of being a, a river, you know? Um, so that's, uh, and, and I will say that one of the things I like about the crowdfunding piece is it allows us to reach a big audience broader than the people participating in the event with the importance of native fish. And, and so when, when someone reaches out to their neighbor, the neighbor's going to ask, well, what's this for? And that person has the opportunity to, to spread the, the message of the importance of native fish. And so I, I don't know how many hearts and minds were, were changing, but certainly um, cutthroat trout are, are, is a word that people have heard now that they wouldn't have otherwise. Exactly. Yeah. The cutthroat trout. And that's, we had a, uh, we did an episode on the uh, kind of more of the New Mexico recently um, with Taylor Stride, and we talked about some species. And yeah, I mean, there's a ton of native fish that people have no idea. And cutthroat is, is so diverse. You know, there's like you're talking about. You've got it one you're focusing, but I'm not sure how many species there are. But there's probably there's probably over fifty, right? Different cutthroat species in the country. I'm sure. In the West, I think it. I think it's more like seventeen or eighteen. Okay. And a great resource for for your listeners is. Uh, the Western Native Trout Initiative, who's a, a partner of ours, a conservation partner that we give money to from time to time, um, and they've got a native fit or native fish challenge uh, for the West that basically tells people where to find um, recreational fisheries for all of these uh, these cutthroat trout subspecies, and so um, they're a great great resource, great organization. So I'd encourage. Uh, your your listeners to go check out Western Native Trout Initiative. Their acronym is WINTI, W N T I. Oh, okay, yeah, WINTI, perfect. No, this is good. So, have we? Um, I just had one other note here on the, the the trout man. I'm not sure if that was part of your. Is that another little event you guys do? Yeah, yeah, that, that's actually a good good timing here. So the the trout man is um, another way that that I've found to engage in flyathlon related behavior um, outside of the official events. So. That is a essentially a marathon version of the flyathlon. So you've got to run a marathon that gains over 3,000 feet, catch four different trout species, and drink a 12% craft beer in oh, under wow. 12 hours. Damn. And we, we, we have a, a local metal artist friend of mine who builds these ridiculous uh, 
belt buckles if you're able to complete that. And we've got maybe just under 10 folks over the last five years who've, who've completed it. Um, but we've got one guy uh, who's, he's an ultra runner uh, and he's done, done it six times now. And so in order to keep Brian motivated, Brian's also on my board. I created something called ultra out, which is uh, with umlauts over both of the use just because um, it is a 50 mile race with five, fish species and 5,555 uh, feet climbing and then a 15% craft beer. And oh, he wow. did that. He did that two days ago. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm trying to yeah. continue to find ways to keep what, that. What's the 50? What, what's the distance? 50 miles. Yeah, so 50 he, miles. Damn. Which, which is, which is nothing for this dude. He's right. training. Oh, right. He's training for a hundred mile race oh, in the yeah. same, um, uh, in the same mountain range right now. So it was actually a spontaneous thing for him. He, he called me and he's like, dude, I've got the five fish and I need to find a, uh, you know, a 15 plus percent beer in Buena Vista. Can you help me out? And so <laughs> I, I called around and was able to track down a, a dogfish head worldwide stout aged in some barrels. It was warm, but he, he got it down. And yeah. So he's our, our first official old trout completer, which that's it. Uh, makes me uh make changes my calendar a little bit for yeah. late this summer because now I got to get it done. <laughs> what would be so you have the beer? I mean, that's definitely the leg of it that is kind of the wild card. If if that was, and, I, and I'm trying to think of the again going back to the swimming, um, running, biking comparison. Like, how do they? You know, if you had to, the the beer seems like if you if you didn't have that one, what else would be the third leg of this thing? You know. Uh, People have asked over the years if there's a lot of mountain bikers out there who aren't runners who have oh, said, right. hey, can we create a mountain bike event? And we've actually been talking with uh, New Belgium Brewing in North Carolina. So they started in Colorado, but they've got an Asheville brewery. And so we've got a couple guys from New Belgium who are interested in doing something out there. And we've we've talked a little bit about maybe bringing mountain biking into the mix because that's a, that's a big deal out in Asheville. Uh, so, you know, the, the, I, I guess I'd say the sky's the limit on what, what we could do with this. And it's really just been a, a, uh, limitation on my time, having a, a full-time job and, and all of my board having a full-time job. So one of the things we're trying to do with the nonprofit is come up with a strategic plan for the next five years to figure out how we can potentially fund an executive director mm -hmm. to to take it to the next level and really um, capitalize on some of these opportunities in other places in a meaningful way, because I'd, I'd really love to see the, with 500 grand raised with a, a grassroots event like this, I, I, for cold water conservation, it makes me think we could, we could have a huge impact if we yeah. were just able to dedicate more time to it. Exactly. Yeah. You guys could, I mean, 500 grand with what you've done, sounds amazing and i'm sure you could you could get that over you know whatever whatever number you want if you had actually a staff yeah so if 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 you have any you know sugar daddy listeners out there who are hedge fund investors yep. who want to there invest a bunch of money on we, this <laughs> we might we might we'll put the word out so so if we do we'll just send them over uh, we'll have them give you a call right directly yeah and i promise we've got good beer in exchange for you know for, totally yeah yeah, I love the beer, the beer part of it. The good beer part of it is like, you know, it's it's awesome. What, what's your like? Um, what's your favorite beer? If you had to say the style of beer, what do, what do you like? Oh man, that's like picking children. Yeah, uh, I'm a I'm a big barrel aged imperial stout kind of guy, mm. uh, and we've got a couple local breweries here that do it. Oh wow, do it real well. And a stout is kind of a um, not necessarily it doesn't have to be a a, a brand. Describe like how's a stout, a imperial stout, different from just a stout? Uh it's higher yeah, abv more, more robust more ingredients i think uh, i'm not a brewer yeah. but I, I think it's just more of everything and then they put that beer in a in a barrel like a, a whiskey barrel and then the beer takes the flavors from the wood and from the, the whiskey oh, yeah. and it gets even higher abv and so yeah. they're real real complicated uh taste profiles and um yeah that, so that i'd say that's that's one of my favorites and there's a uh, uh, founders out of Michigan 
uh, makes a, a beer called uh, the Backwoods Bastard, which is I just kind of like it because I feel like that describes me pretty well. And that's a mm. barrel aged Scotch ale that clocks in at like oh, wow. 12 percent. So that's yeah. one of my faves. Oh, that's cool. So and and I was just going to note we and just to show you how much I like beer, this is obviously a fly fishing podcast, but we, <laughs> we we've actually had one interview with the uh, founder of a microbrew because obviously Colorado's huge, but, but Oregon has a ton of micros as well. And, yeah, uh, and we had the uh, Fort George founder who's out in Astoria, and yeah, Excellent. it was really it was really cool, man. He told the whole story of actually, you know, it's a good episode because he talks about. I love the history piece, and he actually goes in the history of like how they were one of the early companies that started putting, um, you know, like IPAs in cans. You know, yep. back in the day, you know what I mean. Yeah, you probably remember, maybe you don't, but I remember when there were no cans. The only cans you get were like Budweiser. Yep. And, and then eventually it's like, wow, okay, there's look at these good beers are coming out. And it was so cool because on the river trips and stuff, having a good beer in a can is way better than a bottle. So anyways, I'll I'll put a link to that one to show us. And just so you know, I am I am not only uh, I'm probably the running is probably my least. That's the one thing. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah, I would say that that's probably uh most. for for most of your listeners, they can relate with beer pretty pretty well, but the yeah. running part is That's right. um is less interesting, but it it's really um, I would say for, for fly fishermen out there, if you're, if you're able to run way back there, you're going to see fish that see less pressure and, um, see some pretty beautiful parts of the country versus just staying on the main, main drags that show up on the, uh, you know, on the big board at every fly shop. Uh, yeah. if you're willing to get way back there, there's some pretty incredible fishing. Rare Gear not only makes a great telescoping fly rod package, but is also rethinking the way fly fishing kits are put together. They allow you to travel lighter, faster, and and just do everything a little quicker. The rod is a blend of traditional Tenkara styles, and uh, Derek has noted how he created this because of some of the uh, some of the things in the rods, the Tinkara style rods he wanted to add, and that's why this thing comes with a complete package, rod, reel, line, everything fits together uh, in a little package. It's got a, uh, a neoprene rod sleeve uh, that protects it. It's a pretty cool thing. And as you hear on this episode, the Flyathlon, we talked about the rare gear and how perfect that was for what the Flyathlon has going. Obviously, trail running. Uh, jumping out of uh, off the trail and fishing fast is what a telescoping fly rod is all about. But there's a lot of other uses for this. Uh, maybe you just want to add another rod to your quiver, have a nice backup. I like having it in my backpack at all times. So if I'm out there, wherever I'm going, um, like today, I'm going to be at the beach. So I'm going to have that rod in my pack so I can pop it out, make some casts. And hopefully, hopefully today I'm going to have some surf perch. That's the goal. That's the goal for this one. Rear Gear is innovating gear and fly fishing to help hikers, bikers, multi-sport enthusiasts, and everybody out there cast a line in their next adventure. You can head over to raregear.com right now to check out this super unique and super weird rod uh, right now. And I, I do say weird because I know Derek in the last conversation we had, he mentioned uh, that's a that's one tagline we could throw out there. This is this is probably the weirdest rod that you've seen, and. Um, and although it is weird, it's definitely super clean. And uh, you got to take a look right now. That's Rare Gear, R E Y R G E A R.com. Check it out right now. Well, we're going to take it out here pretty quick. I did want to check in with you. We've got our own uh, couple of our own challenges. And, and one of them is the, uh, is the top fly challenge, which is, uh, is a way that we're kind of trying to figure out, you know, the, the kind of the number one fight. It seems like for you guys, this would be a good one because what we're doing is essentially everybody can go to wetflyswing.com slash top fly and then enter um, their favorite fly if they had to pick one. And then we also have our guests who have been on and we've got a list so they can pick from those guests what, what their top fly is. And, and and we pick a few winners that get a free fly box with loaded with those with some flies. But um, but for you, what would it be? So if you talk about your fly, you've, you're on your event. You've only got one you can bring. Uh, what is that fly? Um, it would depend on the on the course, obviously. On the let's take it to the, that big course. Let's take it to your big. You're, you're on the bigger river. What what, what was the river? It was the green? Uh, no, the uh, Lake Fork of the Gunnison. Oh, the Gunnison. Yeah. There, I'd probably fish. You know, a lot of my friends and board members have uh, have uh, migrated over to the 
Euro nymphing style, and and I'm I'm yep. trending in that direction because it's so so damn productive. Yeah. But I, I'm still a, a dry dropper kind of guy, so I'd probably throw a a big ass chubby with a um, orange size 18 Pertagon. Uh, I think would would be what I would start with on the on the lake fork. That's it. And then if that's not working. I, I do a lot of high mountain lake fishing too. So my, I got a lot of nice uh, olive woolly buggers in my mm-hmm. uh, box. And if I, if I'm struggling with the uh, dry dropper, I'll throw on a, a big green woolly bugger. And if that's not working, I'll go bigger and greener, bigger and greener. And, and what is your, and what is, if you had, just let's take what I've got to narrow you down. You could only have one for our challenge. What is it? Cause this is going, uh, in the, this is going on the, on the page. We're going to add this. To, I'd you're go be... with the, uh, with the size 18 orange pertagon there you go so uh, that is perfect so we'll add that so that'll be another another fly that uh that we can choose from and uh and this is good yeah i think the euro nymphing is obviously an effective method do you find yourself um i mean fishing wise do you feel like you're more in the um you know kind of expert range or more towards the uh you know what i mean like beginner range you know you think you think you're pretty good and then you go out with uh I've got my my buddy and board member Ben McGee, who's incredible, and it it so that's always humbling when you think you're you're pretty good and, and go out with someone who's really good. Yeah. So I'd I'd put myself in the mid yeah. mid range, and I'm I'm stubborn too. So like with this Euro nymphing bit, like I've fought it for so long, and Ben's just mocked me uh, yep. for for not embracing it, and so I'm getting there, um, but. I, I can usually go to a body water and, and catch a fish and, and in a survival situation, I think I'd do all right. That's right. There you go. So perfect. Probably like, like a lot of people listen, you know, no, nobody, you know, considers himself an expert, probably even the experts I'm sure don't, don't do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm skeptical of, of anyone who would label themselves as a, at an expert at anything. Yeah, exactly. That, that's, I, I think, uh, there's, everyone can learn. Yep. Yep. Okay, uh, and you got this event. So this a- episode probably is going to be dropping sometime in July. So is this w- when is your event uh, coming up in July? Uh, it's July twenty third, the weekend of July twenty third, I believe. So um, it's it's uh, that one's totally full, and they fill up pretty. Oh, oh, so you guys actually have limited, yeah, limited numbers. We do because we want to limit the pressure on the creek. Um, yeah. I'm a I'm a federal fisheries, uh, scientist. So I, you know, I have a sense of how many, how much pressure th- these are pretty like the Lake Fork sees a lot of pressure. This middle Creek is in the middle of nowhere. And, and the 65 people that descend on it for, for one day is, right. is, is the majority of the fishing pressure it sees, but I don't want to put 125 no. people in a small Creek. No. So, and, and then people are fishing on top of one another too. So yeah, they're capped at, 65 ish and they fill up pretty, pretty quickly. But, um, that's, that points to the importance of trying to find other opportunities because exactly. every year we do have people who are interested, who, yep. who can't get in, who we encourage to come out to the party in the woods and volunteer a little bit and see what it's all about. There you go. Yeah. That, no, I, that's why I had the thought at the start is this, you know, for you growing this thing, if you wanted to really grow it, yeah. Do you, do you double down on one event or do you go on a lot? But it sounds like, yeah, because you want to, on the conservation, you want to stick with uh, probably just getting more events around, the, which is great, right? You, I mean, there's, it sounds like there's probably lots of people that would love to help start an event, right? Yeah. They, they just really need to be, it, it takes, it takes some work to do. And, and, you know, I probably, uh, neglected my children and, and family a little bit over the years pulling this off. But, um, I think if folks are, are really interested in, in building a community around, uh, around freshwater conservation and, uh, the, the, the events are so much fun and, and people look forward to it every year and come back. And it really has, that's been the best thing about this is the communities that it's created. And so I, on social media, I'll see people, who met at our events going out and fishing together or going for a run together. And, and then they reconvene at, um, at these flyathlon mm-hmm. events. So that, that's pretty cool to, yeah. to see the community develop out of it too. And, and that's what I would encourage anyone who wants to try to start one of these to, um, just think through what that might mean. And, 
um, I, I think this world needs a lot more community building and, and a lot more good times in the woods because yeah. there's so much to get bummed out about that. Uh, a lot of people look forward to just getting back to nature and getting outside with good people. Love that. Yeah, that's that's probably a good way to, to end this one is the, the community, especially coming out of what we just came out of, right? We're coming out of this COVID thing and, and it's like, wow, you know, community, you know, just getting in person and, and I mean... And we're kind of back to it, right? We're for the for the most part. Um, did you guys in that year you did the virtual event when you had it going on? Did you ever think that man, the virtual event would be a cool thing to keep going to keep connecting people around the world? We did. We we rebranded it uh, to ch- just create an opportunity for folks to to engage in flyathlon like behavior if they couldn't fly across the country to Colorado or Iowa. Um, and so we we were calling it the long distance release flyathlon and and a fraction of who signed up in 2020 signed up. And so really at that point, it's a, it's a question for us of effort versus reward, both in terms of fundraising, but also in terms of engagement of people. So we, we went instead with this fastest known fish concept, which allows people to do, do it on their own time. And it's, it's not a formal thing, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's still an opportunity for people to, to do this sort of stuff in their own time, wherever they are. That makes sense. And and going back to the event. Yeah. People love, people want to get out in person. And then I remember my first, uh, well, my first and only, I did a a half marathon trail run when I was getting into it. And uh, yeah, it was a cool event. You know what I mean? It just went out to some in the middle of the woods and they had the whole thing going, you know, just like kind of you're talking about and everybody was, yeah, partying and hanging and it was just a good time. So that's definitely my favorite part of these things is, after after a great meal has been served and people are crushing beers around a campfire, just I'll just sit there in my camp chair and listen to people talking about the fish that they caught and the fish that they missed. And I'll hear cutthroat here and there. And that yeah. makes me happy. And just the community, people stay up till midnight, just sitting around talking about the, the fishing day that they had. And that's right. Again, I think the, the world needs more of that uh, these days. How does that feel for you? Because it sounds like, you know, you were the person that had the, you know, the starting point, but it sounds like it's really grown where maybe people don't even necessarily, you know, hear your name along with the event. How, how does that feel knowing that you created this thing? Uh, it feels good in in that moment. It, I, I'd say it probably feels more good because I'm, I'm a extroverted introvert. Mm. So after spending the whole day giving out awards, you know, having the, focus be on on me i'm just i don't want i i've never sought that out i don't want that and and so just the the ability to sit around and have it not be anything about me is is uh yeah is a good release for me but also yeah just just hearing that people are talking about conservation and cutthroat and having a good time in the woods that 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 feels that feels that's, good that's but i good. didn't i didn't create it on my own i i could not have done oh yeah own. it's all the all the folks that um a lot of friends and family over the years have really contributed to this and and yeah. so like i said it's a it takes a community to do this and um so yeah that's it and the extrovert and that describes so the extrovert i'm trying to like picture that the, uh, what an extroverted introvert <laughs> is is what again that's the person d- describe that i can the extroverted side of me i can i can hold my own in a social setting i i but i enjoy being oh, right. alone yeah yeah so yeah. that's that's how i recharge my batteries is being way the hell back there by myself with my little dog catching yep. catching fish and, yeah that's it so i can tolerate the um the big you crowds of folks, it. but, but, um, when it's finally time to recharge, it's, I'm, I'm finding that in the woods usually by myself. That's it. And that's a, a question I've asked a few people over the years because I talk about, well, it'd be the same question, different way to ask it is at the end of the day, you know, when you, you're around these events and all these people and talking and stuff, it sounds like you love it. But at the end of the day, are you, you're fully, it sounds like maybe more drained than you are recharged. Oh yeah. At the end of these weekends, I, at the middle Creek race, we stay at this place called the upper crossing guard station. And after everyone is gone, everyone drives away. Most years I'm, there's a Creek that runs through there and I'll just go sit in the Creek and drink a beer and just sit there uh, for, for a while and let it all kind of melt away. Um, but 
yeah, it's, it, it's worth it for me. Um, I've, I've gained a lot of great friends through this who, who then will come run with me in the woods, just, you know, just a couple of us. And that's, that's awesome. So I wouldn't change a lot about the, how this thing has gone. And, yep. um, I don't know how long we'll, we'll do it. I'm, I'm closing in on 50 and you know, the crushing large beers in the woods and large runs will catch up with you over time. Yeah, so. that's right. Right. So you actually see there might be uh there might be an end in sight for, ah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I talk about that in, infrequently because I think it, it produces enough good times for folks that, um, I'll, I'll keep doing it. And are you talking about you, the end of you doing this or the end of the actual, uh, the whole event? Uh, no, I, I, I'm just, I, I'm not talking about either. Okay. We're going to keep doing it. We're closing yeah. and this will be year eight. So, Oh, wow. Uh, we got to hit, we got to definitely hit 10. Um, yeah. so there'll be more, more to come. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I'm, 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 uh, you know, just uh, digging into that a little bit because it's interesting for me to think about this stuff, right? Because you create something and then what does it look like? You know, I mean, Trout Unlimited is a good example or some of these groups that are these amazing groups. And what's it look like when the, the founder is gone, right? And say whatever, 50 years, yep. you know, is that yep. thing still, do you, do you see that vision of that thing still, uh, you know, going out there and becoming something that's, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, seeing the, the Iowa guys, um, and gals do their event. I, I could, I, the one year I went, I was a fly on the wall and I did, I didn't have to be there and, and they were going to pull this off with or without me. So that gives exactly. me hope that if I, if, and when I chose to stop organizing them myself, that, that someone else could pick it up. It's not rocket science. It's throwing a party in the woods with a, with a running race and involved. And so you you want to check all the boxes to make sure that if something goes wrong, you're, you're you've got a plan, but it's not, yeah. uh, it, it's not the hardest thing on the planet. To do. It's not, it's not, but you know, what I was saying is that, you know, and this is a tribute to you probably as being, you know, in there at, at the beginning and, but you know, the Steve jobs thing again, going back to, you know, it's funny, I've been pulled at it because I watched the documentary, but I mean, you know, look, look at it now, right? I mean, this guy, he's got his own share of problems in his life, had his own problems, but, you know, he had this vision of this thing that nobody knew they wanted. And now literally we're doing this podcast, right? Because of that product that he created. And, right. And it was this vision of like, nobody knew it. And, and he had this thing and he dedicated his life to it and probably died because of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's pretty powerful yeah. to think. And then for you, you know, or for all of us, it's like, wow, okay, what what are we, we're doing this stuff. What, why are we doing it? And I can see the the for you the conservation i mean 500,000 that that must feel pretty awesome too yeah i would say a, a lot of the value added of this for me personally has been i i work as you know in the government and there's not a ton of opportunity for for creativity within what i do um and this is like a blank canvas i can make up whatever the hell i want and it, it's a lot of fun in that way. And it, it allows me to be creative and allows me to express myself in a way that I can't in my day job. And so I would tell folks that you're not, you don't have to be your, your, just your job. You can make a difference outside of your job as long as you're willing to invest the time into it. And, 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 and you can do whatever you want at that point. That That's what this has taught me is that I've got a lot of dumb ideas that other people think are, are fun. So yeah, um, that's great. That's, that's that's exciting for me is that it's a good outlet in that sense yeah that's what's fun is that it's a uh you know you're basically you're testing stuff you're like just like you know what let's let's try this out see how it works and some of it sticks and some of it doesn't right some of it works amazingly and yeah. some that you let go yeah it's like it, it's like old old trout right like oh, okay he's mm-hmm. he's done this six times so now i gotta create something else and and then he's like yeah i'll do that too and um it's just it, it's it's a lot of fun to Perfect. To just uh, have people who can also see the fun in what you're what you're proposing. <laughs> right on, right on. Well, this has been good to to track down and hear a little bit of the the behind yeah. the scenes. You know, I mean, I know you've done some stuff out there in the media, and uh, you know, I'm not sure how many fly fishing podcasts you've done, but this is uh, definitely one I've been wanting to get in. So, um, yeah, appreciate you for shedding some light on this, and we'll send everybody out to um, I guess runningrivers.com or dot org. If they want to uh, connect and probably the July one, it sounds like is out, but maybe the uh, either this year or next for the next event. 
yeah, but if, if folks wanted to come out and see what it's all about or, or just go for a run and, ch- and chat about um, or, or, or give me a call and say, I think this would work in, in the Northeast or the Northwest, uh, I, I'm happy to have that conversation. So um, I, I really just want to see people taking care of their own, their own resources and their own fish. Perfect. All right, Andrew, uh, thanks for the time today and definitely we'll be keeping in touch with you and, and sending some folks your way. Right on. Appreciate the time. So there it is. Andrew Todd uh, putting it together today. Wetflyswing.com slash 338 if you want to get the links, the show notes, and hopefully we'll have some videos. You can take a look at this event, see what it looks like, um, and we'll take it a little bit further. Got a listener spotlight today, uh, James Grief. James has been a listener for quite some time, a number of years now. He uh, He's in the northeast part of the country. James, just want to say thank you for your support over the years and uh, and thanks for listening to this podcast. Definitely, definitely appreciate uh, everything you've done over the years and hope to uh, connect with you in person and, and talk to you soon. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Would love to hear from you if you want to check in with us. The easiest way is to jump on our email list and uh, get there. That's a good way to stay in touch. And then you can check with me anytime um, to any of those emails. One shout out we mentioned earlier on, but the Top Fly Challenge, wetflyswing.com slash top fly. If you want to grab some some flies, a box of flies, we're giving away boxes of flies. This is part of the deal here. If you just enter whatever your number one fly is, we got uh, a couple of things to do there. Really simple and real easy to get some free swag. Okay, uh, I'm going to get out of here. Appreciate you for listening in all the way till the very end. Uh, Again, if you get a chance and you want to leave a review, we would love it. Um, That helps us, definitely helps us find more new uh, anglers out there. I know I've talked to a few that are just getting started uh, this last year, and it's a good diversity. So if you're brand new and you're like in your first year, maybe your first month, maybe this is your first week, fly fishing um, we've got a great resource here and the best way to take advantage of it is to obviously listen but check in with me anytime if you send me an email dave at wetflyswing.com uh, or ping me on social i will respond to you and then i will answer your question maybe you need an episode maybe you need a um, i don't know a connection to a local uh, shop uh, guide that's what I'm here for. I'm here to serve you as the listener. So I appreciate uh, I appreciate that. I just want to get out of here with our final take. I'll see you on the water or I'll see you online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.